welcome to supporting university cyber security and student online safety. Um, we'll be discussing what are the biggest cyber security risks facing universities today um, and external security breaches. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. And um, we'll be running a live Q&A with our speakers at the end of the session. So we've enabled the Q&A. So if anyone's got any questions, please pop them in there and we'll ask them at the end. Um, I'm Lisa Ravenscroft, the Communications Manager for Protected, and I'm very pleased to welcome today's speakers. So we've got Bill Taylor, who's the Deputy Director for Information Technology and Digital Services at Teesside University, who's one of our Protected Founder Member Universities. And then we've got Mike Gillespie, who's the Founder and Thought Leader at Advent IM Limited. So this morning, we'll be discussing the impact of the cyber attack on universities, exploring measures that can reduce the risk of breach or data leaks. And our speakers will also share their thoughts, insights and recommendations for future developments in university and student support. So Bill and Mike, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. So Pleasure. first question, um, if you want to first Tell us a little bit about your organisations and universities and teams and um, how you are involved in cyber protection. Bill, do you want to go first, please? Yeah, no problem. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm, I'm assuming they can. <laughs> okay, so good morning, everyone. As uh, Lisa said, I'm Bill Taylor. Um, although I've worked at um, Teesside University for the last uh, 14 years, I'm actually a Geordie, not a Smoggy. So, uh, uh, and as well as being a Geordie, I'm a chartered IT professional through the British Computer Society, and I have been that for, for a number of years too. So I've worked in the industry, as I say, for over 35 years in the public and private sector. I was even self-employed at one point. And, uh, and currently I'm at Teesside University as a Deputy Director in Information Technology and Digital Services. Services. Um, although I specialised in information security and cyber protection before I joined the university, and I'm sure you'll appreciate it's now a necessary part of everyday work and life. Thanks, Bill. Um, Mike Gillespie, I'm the Manager Director here at Advent IM, a company that I co-founded 20 years ago now. Um, and like Bill, I'm a career um, information professional, having been through a range of roles in a range of sectors before setting Advent up. And one of the areas that I'm particularly passionate about is protecting um, both organizations and individuals from the pernicious cyber threat. Great, thank you both. So um, moving on, um, what do you think is the biggest threat to a university cyber systems? Um, Bill, do you wanna carry on going first? Yeah, no problem. Um, You'll, you'll find out uh, through uh, today's uh, session that, that I have a number of catchphrases and one of my catchphrases is three is the magic number. So uh, I'm a great believer in that and, uh, and I also believe in the power of the three P's, in other words, uh, people, process and product. So although there's a lot of reliance on the product, you know, the technology to save the day, I think it's really important not to forget the other two people and processes. So it's just like a three legged stool, basically, you're like if one or two of the legs are missing, the stool tends to fall over unless you're very good at balance, of course. <laughs> So, so I think in answer to um, in, in answer to the question about you know, like the biggest threat, I don't think it's I, I don't think there's any anything as a threat as such. You know, it's all about relying on your people, uh, you, know, you know, and being vigilant. You know, and again, working in a university, you know, like um, to, to quote Tony Blair from back in the day, education, education, education. That's what it's all about, really. You know, if you if you make sure that people are aware of things, if you teach them, if you help and support them. And, uh, and and basically, you know, like then any threat can be can be uh, counteracted. Um, so I don't think there's such a thing as a biggest threat. There's a multiple threats, and I think it's very important to be to be vigilant about all of them. Yeah, I think I mean I totally agree with you there, Bill. Um, I would slightly rephrase the the question if that's okay, Lisa. And I, I would say, what, yeah, of course. what where are the biggest weaknesses? within universities when it comes to protecting themselves against cyber threat. And I think that is twofold. One is that um, many organizations have become overly reliant on their technology Agreed. as being the um, success factor, and it's it rarely is. Um, the other is that over successive years, we've been increasingly sold technology upon technology upon technology and now um, IT departments and security teams are really struggling to manage that IT stack because it's become so complex. 
And then the third factor really is that our biggest weakness is and always has been the human element. Yeah. And a lot of the time when we see things being reported as an organization being hacked, what we actually find when we look at the root cause is it was a human facilitated attack in so much as that we, the people, have enabled the t attack to start in the first place by um, clicking on a link, going to the wrong website, interacting with the technology in a wrong way. We're often the easiest and most available route into an organization. Totally agree. Uh, Mike, I mean, it's my, I'm sure me age here by talking about the weakest link with Anne Robinson, but she always used to say, you are the weakest link, goodbye, you know, and I, and I think you're absolutely right. It's it's all about the people, um, as I was saying, as well as the product, you know, and and of course the, the processes as well. Um, I think that, you know, people, I don't want people to appear sort of like, what should I say, to, to be paranoid about it or, or sort of like worried about it. You know, a lot a lot of it is common sense, you know, you just need to commonly you know, apply that sense. And, um, you know, think so. For example, you know, like I, I always say that you know, like if um, if the vice chancellor emails your last thing on a Friday before you're just about to go home, it's probably not the vice chancellor. You know, and and that and that's the sort of thing. Just to question things, just to you know, like not you know, like um, what should I say, click without thinking, think before you click. Are you trying to imply that vice chancellors don't work Friday afternoons? There, <laughs> they do. But it's not nightly to be there unless they go to Friday. <laughs> I, I, was, I was having a similar conversation though with some people recently that quite often the easiest way to spot something that is a scam and and, and not just in cyber world but a scam generally is the urgency yeah. and the need to react immediately. Exactly. So you know the advice from organisations like the National Cybersecurity Centre to take five. Take a deep breath, step mm -hmm. away from it, think about it, mm -hmm. rather than immediately reacting with it. And that can often save our organizations from a big problem further down the line. Totally agree, totally agree. I think as well, like checking at things like spelling and mm -hmm. what they're actually asking yeah. um, is a good one because they, a lot of the time, the scammers, I mean, I'm not saying that some of them aren't very good because they really mm -hmm. are. Like I've Indeed. had quite a few that have made me think for a minute, mm -hmm. especially, you know, they know the times of year as well. Like, so Christmas, they know to send one about a parcel because people yeah. are getting loads of parcels. So obviously that's something that, you know, people are going to fall for. And year on year, we saw it in the run up to the end of the tax year. There would be the mm -hmm. tax rebate scam. We saw it all the way through the various lockdowns with various um, parcel and postage issue scams. Yeah, they're very good at, at modifying their language and their message to fit in with mm -hmm. what we would be expecting to receive. So, of course, in the first lockdown, we're all shopping from home. Yes. Of course, we're expecting to receive a parcel. So if we get a message that says our parcel has got a problem with it, then, of course, we're going to immediately assume that it's, it's right. So they, they're very good at adapting and using psychology to try to fool us in this respect. Yes. And I think it's really important that we... We as professionals are prepared to ask the question, where, if, we, if we believe that people aren't adequately prepared to deal with these sorts of approaches, is it because they can't or because they won't? Because they're mm -hmm. two totally different aspects. And very often I see organizations, when a, when a member of staff gets something wrong, to immediately assume they've done it on purpose, when actually, yeah. 99% of the time is because we haven't educated them, come back to Bill's education um, mm -hmm. quote, mm -hmm. we haven't educated them and given them skills, the knowledge and the capability to do the right thing, I then agree. that's a leadership issue. It's not down to the user base themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think, and you know, just to add to that, mate, you know, fr from my point of view, you know, like, uh, as I say, we work in an educational establishment and uh, isn't it ironic that we're talking about education, you know, however, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the thing that, you know, you've got to, you've got to assume that people, you know, like are acting in good faith, as you rightly say, um, they're not necessarily malicious. And again, I think, you know, like Hollywood plays a part in this as well, because, you know, like the typical hacker, as it were, is a, sort of like a, like a, a guy in his bedroom, you know, the, that is, that is the Hollywood image. The reality is that these are professionals. These are employed uh, like as in a job, as it were, you know, to uh, to do this. And yes, I mean, we use um, words like hacker, we use 
words like black hats and white hats, you know, which comes from the old cowboy films where the goody wore a white hat and the baddie wore a black hat, as it were, you know. But I think that, you know, in all seriousness, you know, it's 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 all about, as I mentioned before, there being vig vigilant, you know, um, look, using a bit of common sense, uh, not get paranoid, as I mentioned before, there, but but you know, just use a bit of common sense and and think about things before before you you do them, even if you're under pressure from the uh, the would be attacker, you know, don't bow to that pressure, you know, uh, think before you act, as I mentioned before. I think also the education has to go beyond just sort of the basic security hygiene and. Yeah. We have to get better at organizations and giving our users sufficient education on how to use the tools themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we so often see technology being rolled out mm -hmm. without then educating our users on how to use it safely and securely. Agreed. And, you know, in some cases, it's the equivalent of getting all of your users into a group of supercars without checking to make sure they can drive in the first place and then totally wondering agree. whether it's a pilot. Totally agree. And, and also as well, you know, like to, just to give them that, um, support after that training as well um just so that you know because again you know certain people might not want to ask a question in case that you know like uh, oh no i don't know about com computers you know and and have that sort of like uh, that that fear as it were of, of asking you know and and we've always said you know, like in our it department over the years you know there's no such thing as a stupid question you know um probably you know like if you're in a room as you mentioned before there might you know and there's a whole bunch of other people in the room they're probably thinking that same question they're just afraid yeah. to ask it you know Absolutely. and i think that's that's important as well to not be afraid to ask a question yeah. you know and and you know and if we can give you the answer then we will and if we can't then we'll go and find out you know yeah great thank you i think that's moving You're on mute at the moment, Lisa. Not doing very well today, am I? <laughs> I thought I thought you were doing the Marcel Marcel. <laughs> I'm, I'm miming. You've got that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. Um, we think of students as tech savvy, but what are some examples of actions that can put a university in jeopardy? Mike, do you want to go first instead of me? <laughs> yeah, so it's an interesting one because there's no doubt at all that the current generation of um, university goers are tech savvy, but they're privacy poor. Mm. And I think we, for a whole range of reasons, including the way in which the technology companies themselves have marketed themselves and um, drawn younger people into the way in which they use their technologies that a lot of people now don't stop and think about their own privacy or the privacy of the people around them when they're interacting on technology mm -hmm. and in many cases we see people being actually incredibly indiscreet particularly on social media and sometimes that indiscretion can give away valuable information that will make an attack more successful mm -hmm. Um, either on themselves or on the organization in which they're, uh, on whose technology they're using. So I think we need to, we need to understand that being good at using technology is not the same as being good at using technology safely Agreed. or securely, and that we are increasingly being encouraged to forget about privacy so that we can be exploited. Let's be, let's be honest about that. Many of the large tech companies they want us as their customers and they give us their platforms for free because we're the product. Yeah, I agree. And just to add to that, you know, um, I, I'm sure none of you are old enough to remember the Carry On films from back in the day, but there was a famous scene in Carrying Up the Kyber where they were under attack by uh, by you know the, the natives, as it were, and they were just sitting there having having their having their uh, their wonderful meal, as it were. And I think you know, like in a similar sort of way, you know, like the university is always potentially uh, like in jeopardy, under attack. We'll call it what you will, but that's a, you know, like that statement's not meant to scare anyone. I mean, for example, our students and staff. It's about as I mentioned before, they're being street smart, applying common sense. You know, it, both in person as well as online. You know, um, and again, you know, like as, as I was alluding to the age earlier, I'm from. Generation X, um, and uh, so I'm a Gen Xer, and obviously a lot of our students are no no longer Generation X. They're not even Generation Y. They're now Generation Z. You know, or Generation Z, as our colleagues across the uh, the pond will say. Um, so uh, you know, as a Gen Xer, 
you know, I was one of the first uh, group of people to regularly use the internet. And at that time, it was very new, very uh, sort of like a, a, a select few people were using it. And uh, most people like me were enthusiastic and naive about it, you know. Um, however, our current uh, students, as I mentioned before, they're Gen Zs. Uh, and, and, you know, like, and as the phrase is, you know, like most people say like, oh, well, they're digital natives, you know. They're always connected to this fire hose of information. That's the internet, you know. But I know from personal experience before the pandemic, I'm, my son, uh, who's 21 now, and uh, my daughter, who's 18 now, whenever we were going to go abroad on holiday, they didn't ask where we were going. They asked if it had free Wi-Fi, you know, because they were always wanting to be connected. But, you know, seriously, though, just, you know, like, just because you're potentially connected and available, you know, right, and accessible 24-7, doesn't mean that you should be, you know? I mean, you know, yeah. sometimes you do need to disconnect from the world, <laughs> you know, uh, although there is a pressure to remain connected all the time. And especially, like, you know, like if, you, if you're on holidays or something, you know, but as I mentioned before there, don't ever let your guard down, you know, just be vigilant, you know, uh, but obviously enjoy yourself, you know. So I think it's always a, it's a balancing act between security and convenience. I always talk about it being like, you know, like a, a seesaw, as it were, you know. So if there's, if there's too much security, it's inconvenient. But if it's but if it's too convenient, it's insecure, you know, and you have to get that nice balancing act between just and having just enough security. And uh, and as I, as I mentioned before, they apply common sense to to help you judge uh, whether it's secure or convenient. Um, have either of you got any examples of incidents that have happened that you can talk about that won't obviously? Mike, Mike do you want to start? <laughs> that won't obviously put anyone in an awkward situation. Yeah, so um, I'm aware of an organisation I work with that um, they they had a minor security breach where a small amount of um, user account information was extracted. Now, um, at the time, it felt like a, a minor event to them because it was a small amount of user account information. But that small amount of user account information gave away a couple of key things. First, because they had the um, full password, it didn't matter how complex the passwords were, they, all, they already had the password mm -hmm. and they already knew the formation of the user name. So there's then an attack um, called credential stuffing, which is basically where they then stuff those same credentials back against other accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so you may have a work email, but you may also have a personal email. You may also use the same email address and password for your online banking. And, and so what happens is because of that small breach, you end up being breached across your whole life. Exactly. And, and that can also work within an organization because you may be using that username and password to get into multiple facets. So your Office 365, um, you've probably used a, a similar username and password if you're using a secure email account as well. And so the propensity to use, because that's the easiest thing for most of us as human beings, it's the easiest way for us to remember it, the propensity to reuse our credentials across multiple accounts and across our personal and private lives actually ended up with the organization experience a much bigger data breach further down the line. Mm -hmm. Now, the root cause of that was not the data breach itself. It was the failure to understand that users needed to now change their password across all those multiple platforms. And a really good example of this actually was the eBay breach some years ago, where eBay, A, they sat on it for a, a considerable period of time, which put people's accounts at risk. Mm -hmm. Then they forced people to change their eBay account eBay also owned PayPal, but they didn't enforce the same requirement on PayPal. So you may have changed your eBay um, password, but I bet you at bottom dollar, most people who use eBay use the same username and password on PayPal as well. Yeah, and I, and, and I totally agree with that. And I, and I would add to that, I would say that, you know, um, there's a few different things. It's, you know, like in the industry, we call it defense in depth. So it's a little bit like, you know, like if um, if Mike's trying to get into my castle, as it were, he's got to cross the moat, he's got to get past the arches, he's got to get past people pour, pouring boiling water on, uh, or oil on him and things like that. You know, so we always have like defense in depth. A good example of that that we implemented a number of years ago is, was multi-factor authentication. And um, if you don't know already, you know, like the, the different factors are, you know, what you know, for example, a password, what you have, for example, 
example, you know, um, like a UB key, you know, like which is, which is like one of these little sort of like key ring devices that you plug into a USB port and uh, and who you are. So that could be, for example, you know, um, uh, your fingerprint or your, you know, like uh, your, your face ID or something like that sort of thing, you know. So so the idea of uh, some people call it two factor authentication, but it's really multi factor authentication because you can use more than two. You know, you, you can use all three if you want, you know. Um, and I think that that was something that, you know, we we, we haven't touch wood, you know, we haven't had any major uh, breaches over the years and unfortunately some of our colleagues and other universities have uh, but you know but as I say it, it's always that that idea of defense in depth you know so if the if the black hats get through one uh, sort of like one of your defenses then they've got a, then they've got another one to face and then another one to face and then another one to face and invariably they give up and look elsewhere for an easier target you know so 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 you know in answer to your question uh, Lisa you know we haven't luckily had uh, any major uh, incidents, you know, we've had a few minor things, but as I say, because of this d defense in depth, uh, we've always stopped them before they became major. I'm pretty prepared to put my um, next um, monthly salary on the line here and say that with the current energy crisis, nobody's actually deploying boiling oil at the moment. <laughs> Good one, yes, indeed, indeed. Well, well, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean uh, it's, it's, it, well, we might just cover you in cold oil instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in, in all seriousness, though, Bill, I mean, the, the, the key weakness ha within the technology, and, and that includes now with multi-factor authentication, is how the users then um, manage that technology and look after their devices. You know, if, you, yeah. um, if, if you're relying on a text message with a code in it, um, but your mobile phone has got an inherently poor access control on it. Yes then, you know, there is the potential for that to be compromised. You're and right. I saw this back in the early days when government started rolling out um, full disk encryption, you needed a BitLocker um, dongle, which you had to plug into your laptop, you needed yeah. a PIN number, and yeah. you needed, and, and all that happened was the users started keeping all those things together because that Correct. was convenient. Exactly. So they lost it's the laptop, yeah. they also lost the dongle, and they lost their PIN number. Yes. So it's, it comes back to a lot of this is human behavior and attitude and belief systems, which we have to tackle in a more consistent way yes. in order to drive up good behavior. Yes. And a lot of our users don't know why we're asking them to use all these mm. tools. Exactly. And if they don't know why we're asking them to use these tools, often they'll see them as a blocker and try to find a way around them. Correct. Correct. Yeah, absolutely right. You should always start with why. And and with regard to um, say you know like the the uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, again we would not recommend people to use a text message. We would recommend them to use an authenticator app on their mm -hmm. device because uh, obviously as as you know mike and, and some uh, other people on the call might also know you can actually spoof a mobile phone number and of course you can steal a mobile phone you know so uh yeah. so yeah so i think uh, i think it's very important to not only have those things but use the right things as well yeah absolutely right um so we've spoken about this before but as universities um become more larger users of tech, shall we say, so things like key cards, um, you know, swiping into buildings, etc. Mm -hmm. How have you noticed um, any breaches from that kind of thing? Because I know we've mentioned before, Bill, about that. Uh, well, uh, well, I mean, you know, what it was uh, a, a few years ago, uh, this is before all of the COVID stuff, one of our students, and he did this with permission, by the way, so it, so he wasn't, he wasn't being a black hat, he was definitely being a white hat, um, as, as part of his final year dissertation, uh, he did an experiment, uh, and it was social engineering experiment. And that's one of the things that we haven't sort of like talked about so far. Uh, one of the most famous uh, hackers of all time, a guy called Kevin Mitnick. At one point, he was FBI's most wanted uh, across America, and uh, and he termed this uh, termed this phrase uh, uh, social engineering. And what that is basically is taking advantage of people's good nature and people's curiosity, you know. So, uh, so basically, he would always say the way to get into a building is to carry an empty cardboard box, but pretend it's full because people will open the door for you, you know. Yeah. So the idea of tailgating and all those sorts of things too. Um, so going back to our student, um, he uh, he decided to to try a bit of social engineering, and uh, and he dressed up as one of our security guards. And he went throughout the campus and he basically said, like, you know, uh, oh, we've had we've had um, some reports of uh, of card skimming, you know, and what that is basically is you scan the card and uh, you take all of the details off it 
and, uh, and and basically duplicate it and then use it. So you're like, so you're doing essentially identity theft there. And um, it was amazing how many people uh, responded to his request because he looked like one of our security guards, you know? And that's the other thing as well is, you know, like he looked like he was a person of authority when in actual fact, he was just one of our students, you know? So as a result of that, obviously that, uh, you know, prompted us to do a lot of education um, and also change the technology as well. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this, is the, this is the sort of thing that, that was talked about before there. There's that reliance on the technology, but as it turned out, it wasn't the technology that was the, uh, the weakness. It was the people, as we mentioned before there, you know, and I think that's very important, you know, like, so it's a case of, you know, we did that as, as, a, as a test and uh, that test showed that some people refused, you know, which is good. And they said, why do you want my card, <laughs> you know, but other people just handed over the card, you know, and you, and you think, well, wh why did you hand over the card? Yeah, because he was a security officer, you know, and uh, well, he wasn't, you know, and, and that's the sort of thing that, you know, Obviously, con men have been doing this for, you know, decades, if not centuries, you know, and, and I think it's very important that, you know, just because someone looks like a security guard doesn't say they are a security guard. So always challenge. And again, I know it's, I know it's you, know, you know, to be courteous, you know, you might, uh, if you go through the door, you know, say, for example, if I went through a door and Lisa was following me, I might be courteous and leave, and leave the door open, you know, like uh, to, to help her come in. But really, I should slam it in her face. But I'm not going to do that, Lisa, so don't worry. <laughs> I yeah. think the I think again coming back to the education piece here is that um, we're expecting our our users, our insiders, the people who have got authority to get into our buildings and our networks. Mm -hmm. We're expecting them to challenge. Yes. But the first time they're expected to challenge is when they're in, if you like, a danger situation where they're confronted by mm -hmm. somebody who could be a bad person. Indeed. Very few organizations take time to give their users training on how to challenge prior to them becoming in a challenge. They, we tell them to challenge, mm -hmm. but we don't train them and give them the confidence to do that in a safe environment. Yes, yes. And, you know, maybe we need to actually be doing some, um, you know, floor walking and role playing with our users, with our students, yeah. giving them the confidence to be able to do that challenge and how to challenge. Yes, in a, in a safe and confident way I agree. before they have to do it for real. Yes, I agree. And and I mean, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to, it's the language that you, that you use as it were, you know, I mean, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to come across as a challenge. Um, like a phrase that I've used for over a number of years, um, if, if I see somebody come into the building or whatever is, um, I always say, are you lost? Can I help you? You know? Um, and some of them are genuine students or members of staff, for example, who are lost. Uh, it might be their first day or the first week or whatever sort of thing, you know. And, and if that's the case, you're actually coming across as, you know, like a, a sociable, helpful uh, human being, as it were, you know. But if they're not, um, then, it, you know, like it sets off the alarm bells and they go like, yeah. oh, 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 no, 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 I'm not. Um, and, and out they go. Yeah. You know, so, so, so yeah, so there's, there's, there's nice, easy um safe ways of uh of challenging people without and that's what, without that's what I mean is we need we need to show people yeah. how to do that because a Absolutely. lot of people we've got the confidence to do it we've been around the block long enough yes. to know that that's that's an easy and a safe way to do it Indeed. and yet so often when I look at an organization's policy it will simply say if you see somebody who doesn't look like they belong there challenge them yeah. and the very language challenge them yeah. I immediately agree. conjures up confrontation yeah. so I, that's why i think we need to spend time on the skill set that's required yeah. to help people to understand how to challenge in a safe and sensible way totally yeah agree, you don't want to start it off confrontational you want no. to like they'll so start off with a oh you lost you know yeah. and exactly the conversation in because you don't yeah. want people who are like trying to tailgate you just going uh, where you know where are you going and exactly all like exactly. what's that about <laughs> I agree. Yeah. It's 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 not oh. just what you say; it's also how you say it, as the phrase yeah, goes. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. But I suppose that fits in with like bystander training and stuff. Yes. You know that we've been pointing students at and trying to get them trained and you know intervening. So mm -hmm. I suppose it would fit with that, maybe. Indeed. Indeed, in I agree. Yeah. We we've done similar things in the past as a society around you know um, you know stranger danger and giving children the confidence to spot and challenge strangers yes. and then we just need to extend the same sort of ideology to our young adults 
that you know if you're in this situation we're asking you to be part of our security solution mm -hmm. this is how to do it but mm -hmm. do it in a way that still maintains your own safety and uh, you, you still feel your own integrity in terms of a safety bubble mm -hmm. um, because otherwise people are going to feel scared to do the challenge because they're yeah. afraid that they will in turn be yeah. challenged back yeah and as i say you know i mean if someone is genuinely lost if they're not up to no good as it were i've had a number of uh, comments you know like over the years you were know, saying like Oh, I met this uh, this uh, this member of staff, and he was really helpful, and he and he you know and he took me to where I needed to go, you know. So I don't I don't, I don't just like point, you know, like if they are genuinely lost, I literally take them. I says, come on, follow me, and I'll and I'll take you to the building that you're looking for, you know. And the number of genuinely um, sort of like complimentary uh, comments that I've had over the years, you know. So so even it, you know. I might have been challenging them, but, you know, conversely, I was also helping them get to where they needed to be, you know? So and the last bit on that is that if we're encouraging our people to do this, um, then also, um, regardless of who we are in the organization, we have to play our part. And I was, I, was actually, I was actually in a client organization where um, I challenged somebody wanting to follow me into a building not wearing their id card mm. and i did stop and and challenge and effectively they tried to ball me out and one of ironically what they said to me was don't you know who i am and i said mm. well no not really because you're not wearing your pass mm -hmm. good point i agree um but you know you can't have a senior manager then effectively bawling out or bullying somebody else because they've done what they've been asked to do we have to be prepared to play our part totally agree totally agree yeah definitely so moving on mm -hmm. um so the protected code of practice looks at issues impacting students well-being and mental health so do you think that the worry and stress caused by things like cyberbullying and online pressures have an impact on students mental health uh in in very simple response yes mm -hmm. i think uh, so i you know i got into computing in the um early 80s um so i'm like bill showing my age here a little <laughs> bit um the pressures on me as a student back then were insignificant compared to the pressures i see on students today Indeed. in part because the the level of pressure for students to succeed whilst at university is much higher than ever before. You know, the cost of going to university is significant compared yeah. to 30 years ago. Yeah. But also, young adults now are exposed to so much more content and, and they're exposed to pernicious content. And what I mean by that is that Organizations like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of these organizations have incredibly adept algorithms that allow them to pick up on even subtle online behaviors and then market content back to you. Absolutely. Even to the point, and we've seen this, we've seen, um, we've seen programs like Panorama do programs on this, that you could go on and do a couple of searches around anti-knife crime and then be presented with graphic and horrific images of people having been hurt by knife crime. Yeah. And, and so we have, to ex we have to understand and accept and then develop protective mechanisms for our students that this is the first time they'll have been away from home. So in that respect, they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be lonely, so they'll be reaching out for friends. And that includes social media um, reaching out, not just in the physical world. And that in turn makes them incredibly vulnerable to grooming, mm -hmm. to uh, be exposed to harmful content, yep. self-harm content, um, to um, in some cases be exposed to sexual grooming and graphic sexual content. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as organizations, as an individual organizations, there's very little we can do to stop them from being exposed but what we can do is give them the pastoral care and the knowledge to be able to protect themselves Absolutely. and the pastoral care of having somewhere to go to if they feel that they're being unduly exposed to content to say, I don't feel safe. 
Mm -hmm. So we have to give them a safe point. And certainly a lot of work that universities are doing now with their campus security, because the chances are nine times out of 10, the individual will be at the most vulnerable out of ours. Yeah. And the campus security are the people who are there out of ours more than any of the rest of us. Yeah, totally right. And and I mean, just to add to uh, the things that Mike's saying, you know, I mean, for example, it, it's it's even more so for our international students. Around about a third of our students are international, and uh, we regularly come out really well in what's known as the International Student Barometer, the ISB, uh, because we do give them a, that additional pastoral care. It's not to say that we don't give pastoral care to our domestic students, because of course we do, but I think that you know, um, there's cultural issues, the you know, the fact that they are, they're not only no, no longer at home, they're actually in a different country with different uh, you know like cultures and values and so on and so forth, and they are particularly susceptible. So what we actually give them extra pastoral care uh, before um, before the university starts, you know, so so our freshers week is we call it week zero and then returners week is week one. Uh, we always get them in about sort of like week minus two, as it were, in like a couple of weeks before freshers week. Uh, we we help them settle in to their accommodation. Uh, we, we give them um, like social events as well, for example, so they can so they can uh, meet each other um and uh, and not feel isolated, as you rightly said, Mike, you know, so I think it's really, really important to do that. Couldn't agree more. And there's also then there's the, the human to human type of um, issues that go beyond the way in which the, the platforms themselves are interacting with students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've got things that, you know, I, I think I don't think 30 years ago we even had words for catfishing. Exactly. You know, um, these things just weren't concepts that we were familiar with. Yes. Uh, so, you know, things are changing. If you think, you know, we've only just gone past the 30th birthday of the world wide web mm. um facebook is what 15 years old exactly maybe not even that yeah. so things are changing and accelerating all the time yeah and what, one of the things that i'm conscious of is that we we have we have a lot of things that we can learn from mm -hmm. and if we learn from them well and we put strategies in place for the not now but for the years to come, absolutely. as organizations, we could actually, for the first time, be ready and fully prepared. So when we get Gen Alpha into university, they're going to find themselves in a much better place than perhaps Gen Zs do. Yeah, totally agree. And I think that just to add to what you're saying there, Mike, you know, I mean, as far as, far as I'm concerned, you know, um, it, it, Einstein famously said, you know, like the definition of madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You've got to, you've got to learn from uh, from things. You know, what went well, what went not so well, and, and how would you improve things in the future? And I think it's very important as well. You know, like when we're when we're talking about, uh, you know, like you mentioned before, there about social media. You know, it's it's not there. It's not there in their business model to protect uh, people. It's in their business model to make money from people. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that's very important as well. You know, I mean, there is a phrase. You know, that comes to mind: a fool and his money are soon parted. You know. Now, I'm not saying everybody's foolish. You know, uh, but sometimes they may behave foolishly. You know, and and I think that's important to, to remember there that you know, um, it's you know. But again, if you apply it in the real world, you know, if you if you left your house with all the doors and windows open. You know, and uh, would you expect all your belongings to be there when you got back? Well, of course not. You know, um, um, you might be lucky, but you might not. And, and I think it's the same online, especially when it comes to things like identity theft and online banking and uh, and all those other sorts of things. As you mentioned before, there are words like catfishing where somebody pretends to be somebody they're not, you know, and uh, and I think it's really important. So going back to the, the, you know, like the question that uh, that you asked us, uh, Lisa, you know, I think it's very, very important um, to to look after people and to help and support people. And of course, anything that tackles things like cyberbullying or, you know, like um, mm -hmm. people's mental health, you know, and their well-being, obviously, you know, like it's it's not just a small step in the right direction. It's a great leap forward in progress because, you know, I, I mean, I've always said that having worked in IT for a long time, you know, the wonderful thing about IT is that it changes all the time. But the terrible thing is that it changes all the time, you know, and, and it's, it's constantly moving target, you know. And I think that you've got to be, you know, like aware of that. You know, you might think like, oh, okay, like there was an there was an incident. Yes, we fixed it. But as but as Mike rightly said, that might fix it for Gen Z. But when Gen Alpha comes along, it might not be applicable anymore. Absolutely right. I think we also need to look um, at societal culture. Yes. Um, and I think we've seen enough in the news over the last few months around certain organizations and toxic culture 
an organization doesn't just develop toxic culture overnight. They mm -hmm. develop toxic culture by toxic behavior becoming normalized because, because people don't speak up about it. Or when they do speak up about it, we don't intervene. Yes. And I think that as universities, we absolutely have to be prepared to call out inappropriate behavior and deal with it in yeah. order to protect the, the, the wider community. Okay. Otherwise, other people see that poor behavior, bullying, um, harassment, mm -hmm. sexual assault, all of these things. If they're not called out and dealt with initially, then other students will think it's okay for them to do it as well. Indeed. And before we know it, we have got normalized racism, we've got normalized yeah. sexism, we've got normalized misogyny. Mm -hmm. We have to not allow inappropriate behavior to become normalized in the first place. And that's mm -hmm. a major way in which we can protect people, mm -hmm. um, whether it's in universities, and I think it's, it's vital in universities because we have young people who are learning um, social skills for the first time as young adults. Absolutely. And they are, like, they are like sponges, they will soak up what they see around them. But that's from us, the, the adults in the organization, or from their fellow students who are their peer group. But it's vital across all other organizations as well, because yeah. there's no doubt at all that here in the UK at the moment, we are on the verge of having a toxically normalized society mm -hmm. where racism, misogyny, sexism mm -hmm. are becoming almost the normal. Mm -hmm. And people are going, oh, God, look at that. Another organization with um, institutionalized uh, yeah. misogyny. <laughs> look at, the, look oh, at that. Another one. Oh, another yeah. one. Yeah, look at that recent report about the Metropolitan Police, you know, a yeah. case in point. I totally agree. And I think that you're absolutely right. It's about forming uh, young minds, you know, um, mm -hmm. and you can form them for the good. Yeah. or not so good you know and i think you're absolutely right it's it's you know like it's, it's an opportunity to to do that uh, yeah. especially in the university context um and you know because obviously at the end of the day or at the end of their degree you know we hope that they get a good job a graduate level job and go out into the world of work you know and if they can be a a, a paragon of virtue then uh, you know then that virtue spreads you know so not only does uh, does um, that, that the negative side of things spread you know the positive side of things can spread yeah. too Oh, definitely. The young adults that we mould in university are the workforce of the future. Totally agree. Totally agree. Definitely. Thanks both. So we have a few questions, mm -hmm. um, which I shall ask the first one now. Um, so are cybersecurity measures implemented by higher education institutions standardised across the sector, or does each university <laughs> tackle cyber, cyber security in their own way? Uh, shall I start, Mike? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the wonderful thing about standards is there's so many to choose from, Lisa, and that's and that's and that's what the that's what the issue is. You know, uh, we all like to do the same things and you know, like in different ways. You know, whereas we really should be doing the same things in the same ways. There are obviously um, you know um, standards. For example, at Teesside University, uh, we're working towards our cyber essentials, so that's that's a, a very good standard. Um, you know, and and there are other ones out there as well. Some of them are, are, you know, like national standards. Some of them are international standards, you know. Um, but obviously, you know, like, it's that idea of like, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. If there is a standard that, that will work for you, use it. Mike? My experience is that at the moment, um, the approach to cybersecurity in university is not standardised. Mm. Um, which is slightly different to whether universities are following a standard. Yes. Um, and in some cases, even with standards, there can be interpretation of what the standard means, which can result in disparities as well. That's true. That's true. I don't doubt at all that Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus is a great way of addressing the technological element of cybersecurity. Absolutely. But it doesn't address any of the cultural and behavioral stuff that we've yes. discussed. And that's why sometimes you need to mix and match, as it were, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think there is a valid argument for having a higher education cybersecurity standard mm -hmm. to be used as a framework for universities to develop a consistency of approach. We're all part of the same um, core network of trusted organizations. Yeah. You all have, you know, ultimately, we're all connecting into the same wider backbone. So if we don't all get it right, we all pose a threat to each other. Absolutely. So I think there is a there is an argument for um, higher education 
standard or framework, even if that is to say, as a bare minimum, all universities should achieve cyber essentials. It's at least a step in the di right direction for standardization. Agreed. And I think, and I agree with all of that, uh, Mike, and I would even add to that because again, people might think like, oh no, another standard that we've got to adhere to, another thing that we get audited mm -hmm. on or something like that, you know? However, you know, I mean, you could talk about the carrot and the stick, but I prefer to use the carrot shaped stick sometimes, you know, in terms of cyber essentials, uh, not only does it keep you, you, and your, and your and your organization safe, it also is an opportunity for a revenue stream, you know, so, so, so basically, like, you know, if, if that is a standard that that um, potential customers uh, need you to adhere to, and you don't have that standard, then there's a revenue stream that's cut off to you, you know, whereas if you have that standard, that rubber stamp, as it were, that, uh, that certificate, as it were, which, uh, which, you know, you say what you do, you do what you say, and you can prove it, then, uh, then that's a, then that's a positive um, thing as well. So not only about keeping people safe, but also, you know, if, if, uh, if the, yeah. if the, uh, the, the, the finance um, department says like, Oh, it's a lot of money. And you know, a lot, you know, then you go like, ah, well, you know, it's an investor save really as well. So you can actually think about it in that way too. Thanks both. Um, next question. Um, how do universities share good practices or information about emerging threats? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, we, we are part of a number of different uh, organisations um, and not just university wide either. Um, as uh, you know, like as Mike said before, there you, you know they, we all use the joint academic network, and uh, we all sort of like you know, use um, other organisations like JISC and USIZER and things like that. Um, but for example, myself, um, I'm regional chair of Socketum Northeast, which is the Society for Information Technology Managers, and that's all of the public sector in the Northeast. Um, and um, Socketum is a national um, organisation as well. So, for example, this afternoon I'm going to be in, in, a, in a, um, a session with all of the other um, regional chairs as well. So we do have a number of different mechanisms that where we share information, share good practice and work together as a community uh, rather than working in, in different ways you know, like uh, to different ends. Mike? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think the question is more, do universities adequately share uh, information and intelligence about emerging threats, vulnerabilities, incidents that they've experienced? I think the the collaborative tools are there, but maybe we need to try using them more and using them better. Mm. And it's, I think it, it's one of those interesting things because we're not talking about universities as being part of an overarching organization. Mm -hmm. We're talking about literally hundreds of individual companies, if you like, and we're asking them all to collaborate with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we've got another question here, which um, is um, some unis have banned emerging AI tools for students <laughs> to avoid plagiarism on written work. As AI continues to improve, what other changes do you see unis making? as many students will not be able to resist using the tools, which I know yeah. that that's quite a big Come thing. Come on, Mike, you go first, now yeah. I'll tip in. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I would say is that um, when it comes to education, uh, plagiarism is not new. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there have been plenty of examples over the decades of um, very adept students selling their time to other students to write essays for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this this is something that has been around for as long as learning has been around. I agree. To be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming the question has come about as a result of the emergence of the, the new chat GBT. Yeah. Um, now, I, I don't think, and I'm going to be prepared to be shot by down in flames by Bill or any of the audience here, I don't think you can stop students who want to use tools like this from using them, yeah. whether it's what's there now or what emerges in the future. Yeah. I think what we're going to have to do is rethink the way in which we mark. And there are, that means we've got to upskill our lecturers and um, the, the anybody working in education on how to retrofit. So 
we know that there are plenty of tools out there that will allow us to put text through and for it to come back and say this text already exists elsewhere yes and we're going to have to start to use tools like that as part of our marking scheme having a blanket ban on this technology in itself is not going to stop students from using it agreed it is it you know just to add to what mike's saying there lisa you know it's it is it's always been a cat and mouse game over the years and yeah there is technology that that can help you like turn it in for example is one of those that we use quite regularly but there's also um you know in response to chat gpt there are already um what you say anti-ai tools out there as well that can monitor and and uh, scan uh, something to see whether it whether there's a high likelihood that it that you know something like chat gpt generated it you know and I think, uh, you know, it's always like cat and mouse, as I mentioned earlier. And But I think you're absolutely right, Mike. It's, again, it's a people thing. I, know, I, I think that seems to be the theme of, of today's uh, session, really. You know, um, our academics, you know, like they, they're intelligent enough and experienced enough to be able to spot these sorts of things too. Because, you know, I, I, I was listening to a podcast the other day. I, I've listened to podcasts for a number of years. There's one, it's an information security podcast called Risky Business. It's an Australian uh, uh, broadcaster called Patrick Gray and uh, one of his uh, colleagues, um, Adam Barlow, who's uh, from New Zealand. And uh, and they were joking on about chat GPT and they were saying like, well, you know, because these sorts of things are now integrated into search engines, you know, the likes of uh, Google is experiment with it and, and uh, Bing is experiment with it as well, which is the Microsoft search engine. And this, and you know, like they were saying that, you know, well, I never thought Skynet would start with Bing, you know, and I think that's, I think that's the sort of thing that, you know, these things are in their infancy. Um, but as there's, you know, as is always the case, someone will come up with some something innovative and then someone else will come up with, with something more innovative, you know, it's always a cat and mouse thing. It's not just a technological thing. It's a, it's a thing that's been ongoing for a number of years, as Mike rightly said. I think also what we need to understand is the potential impact for some of these tools on societal understanding of reality, um, to be perfectly honest. And, you know, we, we, we've heard the phrase fake news um, for some time now. And yeah. um, a colleague of mine has just shared an image with me, which is um, you, using um, ChatGPT and um, another app called Mid Journey. Mm -hmm. um, somebody has created a picture of Boris Johnson surrounded by four police officers struggling heavily as he's arrested, mm -hmm. um, all of which is completely fake. Yes. But looks highly legitimate. Now I remember back when I was in my early twenties doing um, my first junior leadership course. And um, one of the things that we were encouraged to do at the time was to read multiple newspapers awesome. so that we could get um, different viewpoints and be prepared to challenge editorial because editorial came with bias. Yes, absolutely. We have to be careful that as these tools become more and more capable, and you know, the, the fake imagery is not new, but it's getting more realistic all the time. Agreed. The ability to insert fake news, fake imagery, fake propaganda into our lives is becoming um, increasingly possible because of the lower cost of entry to do it. Yes, agreed. And, and I mean, you know, when we mentioned before there about, about you know, like our, our students, you know, part of higher education is being able to question and see yeah. other points of view, not just yours, and appreciate other points of view, you know, yeah. and, you know, and, and I think that's something that, you know, obviously the media, you know, like, is very saturated and in, in, into one way of thinking, it's either right or it's wrong, you know, and of course, we all know there are multiple shades of grey. And, and I think that, you know, you've got to, you've got to look at multiple sources, and, uh, and judge for yourself. Let's not also forget that uh, Stephen Hawking um, actually said that artificial intelligence, when it becomes um, sufficient enough to genuinely be artificial intelligence, will either be the making of humanity or its destruction. Totally agree. And I mean, and again, as I was saying before there about, about Hollywood, you know, the, the talk about dystopian future. And don't get us wrong, I love those films, the things like The Matrix, Blade Runner, uh, all those sorts of uh, dystopian future things. And, right, you know, but that, but you've got to remember, at the end of the day, they're fiction, not fact, you know? And I think it's up to us to uh, to lead that conversation and make sure that people, you know, like, do look at the facts, not just the fiction. Mm -hmm. Do you also think that um, the chat GB 
team might be adopted by cyber criminals for more oh, definitely ties like in and efficient even yeah. and social engineering definitely definitely well, already yeah. is yes it is absolutely right and i think that's the thing you know like any tool you know, can be used for good or used for evil, as the phrase goes, you know, and, and I think that, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. They, they are definitely using them, uh, the black hats, uh, as well as the white hats. Absolutely right. Thanks both. So we haven't got any further questions. Is there anything else you want, either of you wanted to cover while well, we've got a couple of extra minutes? Mike? I would, I would just say that whether it's for any of us um, in our personal lives, uh, looking after the people around us who care. You know, certainly I spend a lot of time talking to my family. Um, you know, I would, um, I would say my mother-in-law's understanding of cybersecurity has increased exponentially over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And that actually has protected her against scams. Absolutely. Talking to our children in a mature way, not a lecturing way, but in a mature mm -hmm. way about the threats that are, posed by the world as a whole and in, and in particular the cyber world yeah. and in our workplace making making the security of our lives part of everyday conversation will actually take us to a much more mature much more capable space than any amount of technology ever will totally agree and you know like going back to one of the the questions before there about being digitally literate it's not about being digitally literate it's about being or, or, or for that matter being digitally competent it's about being digitally confident and uh, and as i said earlier not being afraid to ask thanks both that's brilliant um so thanks everyone for your questions and for attending this protected reflection session so thank you, Bill and Mike, obviously, um, for being with us this morning and sharing well, such in-depth knowledge in the um, discussions. Um, so the video of this morning's session will be made available shortly on the Protected website. So um, if you take a look, and we'll put that on our um, social media as well for everybody. Um, and if you wanted a copy specifically, um, if you send me an email, I'll get that out to you. Lovely. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having us along this morning. Great. Yes, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks really appreciate everybody. it. All right. Cheers Take for care. now. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.